Hi, how are you? Very good. So I can see um, Rebecca. <laughs> so I can see one of my patients from London from here. Oh, wow. And I'll have somebody. So, you know, it's uh, the support group is uh, 20 patients or 200 patients I've seen. Wow. So it's uh, the numbers are completely different uh, at every meeting. So the next one is on, uh, on uh, I told you, on uh, dealing with uncertainty. So um, I think that should be good as well. I think the maximum patience we had was for the BRCA testing. Wow. Yeah, a lot of questions as well, yeah. Rebecca, you should moderate the uncertainty one. Yes, 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 yes. That will be great, actually. Somebody with a psychology background to do it, really. Wonderful. So I think, um, uh, Rekha, you are there from River Root. So Rebecca is moderating the next session. So that's on the third Monday. Is that okay, Rebecca? On 17th of August, that's the third Monday. Uh, Vidyut, can you please uh, co uh, can you please make uh, have, Dr. Rebecca as a co-host? I have done. Okay. So are there usually questions on the chat? Yeah. Come yes, or uh, usually on the chat, I think, yeah. Hi, Bhavna. Hi, Dr. Shona. Hi, Geeta, Hi. you're there. Great, lovely Hi. to see you. <laughs> I've been watching for some time. So you and Neeta were supposed to do it, but Neeta <laughs> is, uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Is it operable or what, Bhavna? Yes, done. Done, huh? Done, yeah. Oh. Actually, it's quite good. So, good news. Okay. So not too bad. How are things in Pune, Shona, with the... Very bad. Very bad. Very bad. We, we've outrun Bombay. We're three times that of Bombay now. Delhi and is quite uh, all my colleagues and all have got notices. I'm exempt because I'm over 55. <laughs> Everybody below 55 is, is threatening to be called in for duty. Really? So uh, I, I, I have another couple of years. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're so are much you younger. Are you doing COVID duties? So no, not, no, no. not yet. <laughs> But uh, the, there's, uh, uh, especially those who haven't been working full time will be called. Yeah. So uh, they are asking for that. We're running out of ICUs. We're running out of ventilators. And uh, we had what close to almost 3,000 news yesterday. But we've ramped up the testing also a lot. So mm. I don't know it's whether it's or not that, you know. Yeah. Probably that, yeah. I don't think any of our figures are right. I think uh, both the denominator and the numerator are unreliable, right? Yeah, very much like our cancer figures, you know, very huge. <laughs> yes. Huge underestimate, yeah. Yeah, because everybody who, who listens to our data says so few cancer cases. Yeah. You know, for your population, it's even if the risk is low, it's still too low. Hi, I can see Vandana as a... So, Rebecca, you are happy to moderate the next session on 17th? Yes, Bhavna, will do. So actually, it's, it's, a, it's a life coach from Pune, Mr. Milan Jadhav. Okay. So, he's talking, on, this fellow. So he's talking on dealing with un uncertainty. uncertainty. So, I've had great uh, feedback from a lot of people who've... Uh, heard him. Take, yes, who've heard him and taken advice and everything. So, Shona, the floor is yours. You, you we can start whenever you want. I okay. think it's six o'clock. So we just got an hour. Yeah. 
Yeah, and pe- I think guess people will keep tuning in. So keep tuning in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so good evening, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Global Breast Cancer Support Group. We have a real treat for you today. We have a very eminent breast surgeon from India, Dr. Geeta Kadyaprat. She's a sur- breast surgical oncologist and oncoplastic surgeon, and currently at Max Saket. And she's going to talk to us about mastectomy and different aspects of breast surgery. A lot of you must have undergone those procedures. So I'm sure if you've got any leftover side effects, she's the person for you to catch. So Geeta, will you start off with with your take on keeping a breast with breast surgery? Okay, Um, right. Where have I disappeared? Okay, there you are. So I'll share my screen with you now. Uh, A very good evening to all of you. Um, I'm happy to see quite a few of you people who I know, (laughs) some of my patients. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Yes. Uh, ma'am, stop screen sharing and try again. Stop again. Okay. Why does it say? Uh... Have you made me a host of this thing or? Yeah, I have. You can share. Okay, now I can. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay. So very good evening to all of you. So uh, the mandate for uh, me to speak today is mastectomy. Uh, keeping a breast, but essentially when you say mastectomy, it actually means that you're not keeping a breast, but we are going to talk about how to keep a breast uh, of the situation when you have to deal with a mastectomy. So I'm Dr. Geeta Kadepra. Dr. Shona has already introduced you to me. I'm a breast surgeon. So I will take you through uh, what happens when a diagnosis of cancer is made. So, you know, when a diagnosis of cancer is made, this is, you know, these are uh, invariable situations when Uh, The patient says, oh, really, am I having cancer? No, it can't be true. There is a lot of denial. They want to believe that the report is not true and they run from one hospital to the other trying to figure out uh, if it is true. And when they do find out that it is true, the next uh, question that comes to mind is why me? Uh, What have I done to deserve all this? And whoever I look at doesn't have this disease, so why me? And then there is guilt and regret that possibly that I, there is something that I did wrong. It's, I'm paying for my past mistakes. Uh, and, and then there is this feeling of loneliness because you think you are in this process alone. And uh, there, there is this belief um, that uh, you, you tend to feel like you, you've been singled out and even very close people don't seem like uh, that close anymore. So then, uh, you know, there is grief and sadness. And eventually there is, so it is a cascade of emotions. And then you, you're really surprised by what happens and you want, uh, and women tend to be very family centric and they want to, uh, they just, just think, you know, something has snapped and they keep worrying about what's going to happen to their family, their children, are they going to die? So then slowly, uh, you know, these are usual emotions and nobody should get upset if you feel this way, but that's the way 
uh, you, one, one would behave normally in the situation. And then eventually the time comes when you really accept that diagnosis and go ahead with what you have to do. So when we're talking of mastectomy, what we need to understand is uh, that if you have early breast cancer or if you have, I'm going to talk about mastectomy. So I will just stick to mastectomy. I'm not going to talk about the other options. But if you have early breast cancer or you've had chemotherapy first, then you would be offered surgery. And the various surgical options would be a mastectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy. I'll just come to these, uh, you know, this jargon, this medical jargon uh, as we go along in the talk or axillary dissection, meaning removal or addressing the lymph nodes with or without reconstruction of the breast. Or the second option that could be offered to you would be a wide local excision where you, tend, where you keep the breast uh, and uh, a sentinel node biopsy or an axillary dissection to address the lymph nodes in the armpit with or without oncoplasty. Oncoplasty meaning a procedure to reshape the breast so that even after removing a portion of your breast, your breast doesn't look deformed. So when you choose, uh, so when is it that mastectomy becomes inevitable? So it is a choice. So when I say that these are the two options, it means that there is a choice. But when is it that we say that, look, you are not a candidate for a conservative surgery. You have to go ahead with a mastectomy. That is when there are two or more tumors in separate areas of the breast. Because if it is far apart, you're not a good candidate for a conservative surgery. If on your mammogram, we can see a lot of calcium, tiny calcium deposits within the breast, which is indicative of either cancer or precancerous areas. If you had radiation in the breast region, either uh, preceding this event, it could be uh, you've been treated for a lymphoma, you've had radiation for that, or, and if in that breast, then mastectomy becomes inevitable. And if somebody is pregnant and has breast cancer, and it is possible that uh, you are going to require radiation while you're on while you're on with your pregnancy, then it is best to avoid a, a, a breast conservative surgery and go for mastectomy. And if you've gone for an opted for a breast conservative surgery, but you find that the edges or the margins of the operated lump is still showing cancer, then you have to go for a mastectomy. And then there are genetic mutations. A lot of people ask questions about what genetic mutations are. But if you have got a genetic mutation, then that puts you at high risk of developing a second cancer in your breast. And at that point of time, you would have to go for a mastectomy. But mind you, if you have a genetic mutation, it does not necessarily mean that you have to have a mastectomy. Large tumor, you have a small breast, but you have a large tumor. Therein, uh, breast conservation will not serve you well uh, because you would be left with hardly any breast. Then mastectomy becomes inevitable. And some connective tissue disorders like scler scleroderma or lupus, wherein your skin by itself is so sensitive that you have poor tolerance to radiation therapy, then you should not be opting for a breast conservation and you should be offered a mastectomy and that is what you will get. So there is uh, another uh, you know, inevitable choice in our country when there are ladies who would want to, who choose to go for it even if they are suitable for conservative surgeries, and we as breast surgeons all have performed mastectomies for tiny one centimeter tumors, just because it is your choice. So, you know, we, knew, we know that uh, the greatest power that a person possesses is the power to choose, and we will go abide by your decision when it comes to a choice. And of course, there are situations which are socially driven uh, situations. When the lady wants a breast conservation, but her choice is overruled by the elders in the house. And sometimes even neighbors have a say in how she should be treated. So that is when mastectomy becomes inevitable. So what is uh, mastectomy when I, now we have extended indications of uh, mastectomy too. So when I say extended indications, this is in relation to genetic mutations in an attempt to prevent breast cancer from happening mastectomy may be offered in such situations also. So uh, when, I, when I say, you must have all heard about Angelina Jolie. So Angelina Jolie actually underwent a mastectomy because she was at very high risk of developing the disease because of this mutation that she was carrying in the gene. 
which is a BRCA1, BRCA1 gene. So, uh, so her risk of developing breast cancer was close to an 80%. So that is when she decided to undergo preventive or in our parlance known as prophylactic risk reducing mastectomy involving removal of both breasts to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer in the future. But this is reserved only for those with the high risk of breast cancer, which is determined uh, by strong family history. Sometimes you may not even get a genetic mutation test done, but you have a strong family history, five or six members you know, uh, running, uh, running in your family who got breast or ovarian cancer, then you would uh, opt for a mastectomy. So, uh, so let me just take you through the entire routine of how we uh, do this mastectomy and what happens after that. So the most important th thing is the preoperative routine. I'm sure there would be people who've already uh, amongst you who would have been through this routine. So um, a lot of things that one should take care of because I'm sure you uh, as part of support groups will have a role in counseling those who have recently been diagnosed with breast cancer. And there, I'm sure you will get an opportunity to understand or to make the person in front of you understand what is to be expected. So a medical history, blood work, pre-anesthetic checkup, all these are important to uh, assess for fitness for surgery. And then there will be a nurse practitioner counseling that happens, wherein she's going to talk about overnight stay after mastectomy and four to five days if a reconstruction is required. Um, the patient may want to know what's the duration of surgery. And there is a pre-op checklist. I'll just show you the kind of checklist that we use. And then it is always helpful to show women who are going to have a mastectomy to understand what it looks like. Because a lot of women are under the impression that the breast is amputated and there is a raw surface left behind, which is not true. So what we do uh, have at the end of it is a neat incision, which is uh, sutured or stapled. So then this is also an opportunity to set, set the expectation of the patient for the post-operative period. So you can broach the subject of post-operative care at home, a drain care, physiotherapy and lymphedema precautions, pain management, and talk about support groups. So these are things that should be detailed with the patient when she's about to have her surgery. So this is the kind of checklist that we use when we talk about, you know, irrespective of the fact that the patient may have gone to the anesthetist, it's a good idea to reinforce that you're not supposed to eat or drink at least six hours prior to the time of surgery, that you should have a good scrub bath, take all your medications like antihypertensives or thyroid medication early in the morning with a sip of water. If there are blood thinners, then you must let your anesthetist know because there are certain blood thinners you would want to withhold for a week before uh, the surgery happens. Remove all nail polish and keep your nails short. There is a reason because the pulse oximeter that uh, catches your pulse will not catch it if there is nail polish on your nails. And medical records, very important. You, I know it's like carrying that bag around all the time, but if you're going for surgery, there is no reason for those medical records to be kept back at home. And definitely do not carry valuables to the hospital. Leave all your jewelry behind at home because it, it's quite a responsibility for our nurses when they have to actually uh, take those uh, gold rings or earrings and bangles and keep them uh, safe uh, under their safety. And if there is something that goes wrong, then they're held uh, liable for it. And if there is any ailment, then you must uh, ensure that you disclose it because everything is important. And then of course the consent, consent form has to be definitely signed. Make sure you understand whatever is written in the consent because uh, you, you can uh, approach your doctor in case you need further uh, clarifications. So if you're going to have a sentinel node biopsy, then you, the patient should be aware that she will be shifted to the nuclear medicine department for the same. And the most important thing is obviously uh, you have to reassure her, try to relax, uh, try to get her to relax because surgeries are never an easy event in anybody's life. So when I say mastectomy, I will uh, just, uh, these are, uh, there is a very small risk of complication. Or it's a very safe surgery. And these all will be explained to you while the consent is being filled. Uh, there could be bleeding, rarely ever infection, 
uh, collection of fluid at the operative site. This is very common. This happens in about 60 to 70% of patients. But patients get upset thinking that there is something that went wrong with the surgery and that's why you have a fluid collection under the skin flaps. That's not true. It is a common, common uh, sequelae of surgery and that is a seroma in 60 to 70% you will get this. And 10% of the 60 to 70% you can have a pretty long period of seroma which could run into months, but that should not worry you. Pain, permanent scarring, loss, of a loss or altered sensation in the chest and the reconstructed breasts, wound healing problems. Commonly you would see some marginal necrosis happening in the wound. Uh, diabetics can have issues with wound healing. So all those things uh, can happen after mastectomy. And arm swelling. This is something that happens in about 20% of patients who have an axillary dissection wherein all lymph nodes are removed. And in less than 6% of patients in those who undergo a sentinel node biopsy. Then there could be risk related to anesthesia, but anesthesia these days is very safe. But then you can have things like a pain in the throat, you could have some confusion, muscle aches or vomiting, but these are all very short-lived. So this is the procedure. I will not go into the gory details of it. It is just to reassure those who haven't uh, had surgery yet that mastectomy, a lot of times patients ask, how are you going to do this? Am I going to be awake while you do this? So please understand that it is always, always done under general anesthesia. Unless there is a very special situation wherein the patient cannot undergo uh, general anesthesia for various other morbidities that she may be suffering from. So what we do is, as you can see in the picture, an elliptical incision is what is given and then it is removed. But there are various ways of doing a mastectomy. If you're having a reconstruction, you could have a skin sparing mastectomy where the incision will be around the nipple. Or you could have a nipple sparing mastectomy where you, the nipple would be intact and you would probably place an incision around the nipple like that and remove the breast tissue uh, sparing the nipple. And if you're having a reconstruction at the same time, then a plastic surgeon will also be involved. So when we say a mastectomy in a patient who's got a, bre a breast cancer, you're addressing the breast and you're addressing the lymph nodes in the armpit. So how you address the lymph nodes, I'll just come to this. And like I said, the incision is closed like that. So you have a little scar, uh, not a little, pretty long scar running across the chest, which is sutured uh, or stapled. And uh, sometimes you can even on special uh, you know, request, we would do a dissolving suture also so that the patient does not have to go back for a suture removal. And then there are some drains that are placed under the skin so that all the fluid that accumulates after surgery can be uh, collected into a small drainage bag. So this is what the lymph nodes is. Like I said, one component of mastectomy in um, breast cancer surgery is the breast pit and the other bit is the uh, armpit, the lymph nodes in the armpit. So one has to definitely, definitely evaluate if the cancer has spread into the lymph nodes. So you, in those patients who are clinically, you don't feel a lymph node. While I'm examining you, I don't feel anything. If I see on the ultrasound that there is no significant node, and if there is a node, if an FNAC has been done from the node and it says that there is no cancer, then I would do a procedure called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So here, very few lymph nodes are removed and we are guided to this lymph node with a radioactive isotope which is injected in the nuclear medicine department and a blue dye which is in, injected at the time of surgery in uh, just before we start surgery in the theater. So central node are a group of lymph nodes to, the, to which the tumor is likely to spread first. So if I remove three or four lymph nodes and I send it to the pathologist and my pathologist uh, tells me that there is no involvement of the lymph node, I don't have to do any further lymph nodes, which is great because your lymphedema rate becomes less than 6% and also other shoulder related problems. If cancer is found in the central lymph nodes, we would tend to do a full axillary node dissection. And if on FNAC, your uh, node on FNAC is positive, there again, we would bypass the central node bit and go straight ahead with an axillary dissection. So the central node biopsy is a major advancement in surgical treatment of breast cancer because it lowers the incidence of lymphedema, pain, 
paresthesia is meaning the numbness and tingling that is usually associated with axillary dissection and restriction of the arm movement about which patients can get quite worried about. So in the post-operative period, other than the normal vital signs, one would assess for pain. So pain would be on a visual analog scale and based on the visual analog scale, analgesics can be prescribed. One would want to look for bleeding, hematoma, seroma formation and wound infection. Infection and wound healing problems, though rare, are most likely to occur during the first two weeks after surgery. And then, of course, one has to look after the wound. Uh, so in our practice, in my practice, I would leave the wound open on the day after surgery and ask the patient to just touch it, touch the wound, uh, the incision line with betadine. Uh, of course, the drains, I would put a dressing around it so that the patient feels more secure despite the fact that the drain is put uh, in place with sutures. So the patient or the attendant, once you're sent home, most of my patients would go home the next day itself, and about 95% of patients go home the next day. In fact, in, uh, in uh, places abroad, they go, on, go home on the same day as surgery also. So a breast surgery can be a daycare surgery too. So the patient or attendant is advised to look at the incision to know what is the normal. And at home, if they see, were to see any redness, swelling, warmth, or any pus-like discharge, they should report back to their treating doctor. Then there is the drain. One has to take care of the drain, milking the drainage tube to remove clots and emptying and measuring of fluid. All this is taught to you in the post-operative period in my practice by the, a nurse practitioner. And then post-operative exercises, which in my practice are taught by a dedicated oncophysiotherapist who ensures that you achieve uh, nearly 90, 80 to 90% of your range of motion before you leave for home. So this is uh, what goes on. Uh, we give this leaflet, which is uh, even if you've been, you've been taught by the nurse practitioner, you can always go back and check what you're doing. And then there is a booklet of post uh, breast surgery exercises, something that the uh, physiotherapist goes through with, uh, with the patient. The other common thing that one has to deal with after mastectomy is pain. Uh, because we know that uh, there will be some level of uh, pain sensation, 25 to 60% of patients, because breast cancer surgery involves the nerves being cut. Pain that feels uh, like it's happening in the breast, even after it is gone, uh, it's called the phantom breast pain. Uh, one could have increased sensitivity to pain. Sometimes touch is also perceived as pain, which is known as allodynia. A lot of patients will show pointed areas, just pinpoint areas in the scar tissue, which is excruciatingly painful. And these could be abnormal nerve growth. The nerve is trying to regenerate, but it just goes, does it in a haywire fashion and gives rise to neuromas. There could be sensation of burning, constricting and stabbing type of pain. Uh, and there could be pain in the inner half of the arm. Uh, there could be feeling of numbness. That area doesn't feel normal for quite some time after surgery. So when you'd say dealing with pain, by and large, most of the pains will settle down with over-the-counter prescription medications and such medications as are prescribed to you in your discharge summary. So things like Volini gel can help. Sometimes you may require injection. If there is a neuroma, which is just refusing to go away and causing excruciating pain in the scar, you may require a revision of the scar to remove the neuroma. And physical therapy, I cannot overemphasize the role of physical therapy to strengthen muscles because this is what will eventually lessen your pain. Initially, doing it may be painful, but once you persist with it, you'll realize how beneficial it is to uh, resort to physical therapy earlier than later. So we start the day after surgery, the morning after surgery, the patient is initiated into physical therapy. And if nothing else, uh, you know, complementary therapies are also known to work in a lot of patients such as acupuncture or biofeedback. Then lymphedema precautions is something that we advise irrespective of whether it is um, sentinel lymph node biopsy or it is uh, axillary dissection. Uh, so no blood pressure, no tight uh, jewelry, wear gloves while you garden, wear gloves while you're washing your clothes, use a thimble for sewing, no waxing, use, use uh, epilator creams or uh, electric razor. Uh, you can use um, a mitt if you're dealing with hot objects. Uh, even, you know, avoid 
insect bites also because in our country, ours is a tropical country, get all kinds of bugs. Uh, so you need to protect yourself against that by wearing full sleeve shirts, uh, avoid carrying luggage uh, on your surgical side, uh, avoid lifting asymmetrically heavy objects. A lot of time uh, people tend to yank heavy objects more than five kgs, that's not good. Graded controlled weightlifting is okay. So you can slowly increase your uh, you know, limit uh, on controlled weightlifting. Then this is also a very important part for all those who choose to not have reconstruction. That is usually the case in our country. So prosthesis is a very, very important part. And we have a nurse with a complete set of prosthesis, which the patient can try with her help and see what fits her best. So you can start off with a temporary lightweight cotton filled breast form till the time you finish your radiation if you were to. If, you don't, uh, if you're not undergoing radiation, then six weeks after you can actually uh, go for a silicon prosthesis provided your wounds have healed well. So one type of prosthesis is uh, the usual type that we use is one which, in which there is a bra with a pocket in it and uh, you can place the prosthesis within that uh, pocket. But for those who like to swim, you do have those kind of prosthesis also which adheres to the chest wall and doesn't uh, move out of your swimsuit if you were to go swimming. Then the emotional aspect of uh, you know, any surgery, I think it is so important. It is so important uh, to assess and be sensitive. So see, in, one may think that you know, I, a lot of times I uh, get this view, what's, what's so great about breast surgery? But the thing is, this is cancer you're dealing with. Whether it is colonic cancer, it could be pancreatic cancer, exciting surgery for the surgeon, but I would still think that cancer is cancer and the emotional rigmarole that the patient goes through is the same irrespective of what kind of cancer uh, that a patient may have. So one must encourage the patient to ask questions. It is normal for her to feel overwhelmed and fearful. This is a normal emotion. Don't feel upset that, you know, oh, I cried in front of the doctor. I, I made a mess of myself. That's okay. This is, this is normal. You need to reassure her. And patients have different inf information seeking behaviors. So as caregivers, it is our duty to adapt. Some won't ask questions. They say, docs are whatever you say, you know, is fine. But there are others who may ask you detailed questions, some which are uncomfortable, some questions that you would probably want to uh, talk to the attendant about. But there are some patients who say, look, this is my life. I want to know exactly what's going to happen. You tell me about the recurrence and survival rates. And then there would be those uncomfortable what if questions, which may cause needless anxiety about a situation that may never occur. So you have to tell her, look, you know, what you're asking. So percentages, we always tend to talk in, the ter in terms of percentages, but you must tell her that, look, it all depends on which side of the percentage you may fall. And look at the larger picture. When I'm saying that 80% chance that you will be all right, look at the 80% and don't worry too much about the 20%. So if you, feel, uh, un if you feel comfortable, you can answer the what if questions, but what she needs to focus on is taking one step at a time. I always say it is important to get into the mold of treatment because that is when you realize that you're getting better. Once the tumor is out surgically, you think, oh, that's one bit out and more slowly prepare yourself to the next step. So just one step at a time. So coping with, uh, you know, what, what has to be our mandate is, it's not about surgery, it's not about chemotherapy, it's not about radiation, it is about how confident an individual you send back to the society. So when, after surgery, what are you coping with? You're coping with emotions related to breast loss, with change in body image. So it is important for her to express, it's okay. We need to know how she's feeling. Only if we know how she's feeling can we help her and ask if the surgical result that happened is what she anticipated. She may be very distraught after seeing herself in the mirror without a breast. So then you have to talk about the various options that there may be. Ask her to go for a prosthesis and soon after a radiation treatment is over, she can go for a delayed reconstruction. So that's possible. And then talk about the availability of support groups. And I can't tell you how beneficial support groups are. I think I have benefited more from the support groups than my patients have. And if you don't have a support group, create one. Because 
however much I may say that, you know, you're going to bounce back to being normal, but the moment they set eyes on a woman who looks glamorous, who looks like she's never been through any disease when she actually has been through the journey and just bounces back, uh, looking so good and doing things which she probably never did in her life, you think, wow, this is, this is the meaning of real strength and courage. So provide counseling if you have to, a sadness or depression may persist. If, if, if it persists, if it is not working with the support group, encourage her to consult a mental health professor, uh, professional. Fear of the unknown is something that everybody talks about what's going to happen next, what will be my chemotherapy, what will happen when I lose my hair, what will happen when I, or can I die during uh, chemotherapy? All these are common uh, emotions. Like I said, that important thing is keep the channels of communication open with your patients because the patient really needs a lot of support. I'm sure the family is supporting them, but they also need to know that there is somebody uh, in, her, in the team of doctors or healthcare professionals who treated her, uh, who would be available to answer her questions. So this is our breast support group meeting uh, journey, just a few pictures of what we do on a regular basis. And I can assure you that this is the platform where we discover the true potential of patients. There have been so many patients, I can't even tell you, who tell me that they have never done this whether it is uh, ramp walk, whether it is acting, whether it is singing, whether it's dancing, whether it's poetry, they just don't stop. So it is all about celebrating life nonstop, inspiring one and all, and I can assure you, including the caregivers. I'm sure none of us can dispute the fact as to how much they inspire us every single day. And in these Corona times, the virtual support group continues. Uh, so we continue to, uh, in uh, my uh, hospital, I continue to uh, meet my patients virtually every week. And I can assure you, it's a great learning experience. Thank you. Thank you, Geeta. That was absolutely fabulous. Uh, we've had a few questions through the talk. And uh, I think if you're okay, we can, we can start off with some of these queries. You've answered so much in the last 40 minutes. I've also learned a few new things. So that's been amazing. Uh, the first uh, 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 lady was very concerned and said that hardness remains on the operated side even after eight years. What remains? Hardness. hardness. Yes. So I, I think this is a common complaint a lot of women have around the globe. So is there any answer to this and why does it really happen? So, so if you shed some light. Yeah. So what happens with the mastectomy is you've got these skin flaps and below that is the muscle. And sometimes in some situations, if the tumor is very close to the muscle, some people even lose their muscle. So the, the skin flap goes and sticks itself to the um, pectoralis major muscle, or if your pectoralis major is off, it goes to the minor. Minor may be a thin ribbon kind of um, muscle, and uh, under, underneath it is, this, is, is the rib cage. So what you're um, feeling is probably the thinned out muscle, and sometimes what happens is during surgery, you may be uh, pranking the nerve that supplies the muscle, and the muscle thins out, so it becomes atrophic and uh, the, the skin flap is really stuck to nothing. So it is very easy to feel the bone underneath. And that, was, that is what gives rise to the hardness. So one good way of dealing with this is in the post-op, we encourage patients to apply coconut oil and you know, massage your flaps so that your flaps just don't go and stick there. And then because that gives rise to fibrosis. Fibrosis means there is these, you know, tight bonds between the skin and the muscle. And every time you move, it hurts and it tends to remain hard. So the best way to do it is the more you mobilize yourself and continue to maintain that level of exercise, uh, you know, you probably will not have that uh, feeling. And radiation added on to it only makes it worse. So is, is that also a cause? Of, you talked about numbness and altered sensation in the, in, in the side of the arm. And this, this lasts a very long time. So uh, uh, is this the reason where you tickle the nerve that is supplying the muscle or what is the reason? No, that is, uh, that is the intercostal brachial nerve. This is the nerve that runs from the uh, chest wall to the inside of the arm. Okay. And uh, lots of times, you know, people excise it. But um, I have stopped doing that and I've tried 
to preserve it uh, without actually, you know, you should not be pulling at it also because, you know, you can still have some, uh, you know, untoward uh, or, you know, unsavory, uh, what do you call it, a sensation in the, uh, in yeah. what you even, you know, just pull it. So you just have to, and a lot of my patients, and it's been quite some time since I've heard my patients saying, you know, I've got this. That's Otherwise, amazing. it was such a common complaint that, you know, I feel this inner yeah, brown. We hear it all the time from our patients. And then, then you know, uh, because a patient comes to us for chemotherapy, we are like, didn't your surgeon talk to you about this? Because very often the chemo side effect is left. It's like, but why am I feeling this numbness on the side? You know, right. and I'm like, oh my God, I better talk to the surgeon and, you know, get back to you. So, so yeah. one should try and preserve the intercostal brachial nerve. Um, although there are, there are papers to suggest that it doesn't work, but in my experience, it has worked. Okay. Uh, there was another question about fluid collection. And you very nicely explained that it can last for months after the surgery. So this lady said it lasted for almost 10 months. And then later, uh, there was a lot of hardness after her radiation. So I guess this is part of the same sequelae that you've been yes. talking about. That's right. And uh, is there any reason why some women get so much seroma and fluid collection and some women don't? Is it related to the extent of surgery or uh, uh, what, what is your take on that? So those women who undergo, who are kind of, whose BMI is high, more than 30, 35, uh, uh. and those who have got a lot of excess redundant skin you can make out you, you see a patient and think oh god she's going to have lymph you know she's going to have seroma she's going to have lymphedema so there is a certain body habitus that is associated oh. uh, with uh, you know these intractable uh, seromas and uh, depends upon the number of lymph nodes that you remove to yes. those uh, women who've had a new adjuvant chemotherapy and then come back for surgery they tend to pour much more than those who have upfront surgery. Fortunately, thank God for central node biopsy. We are seeing a fewer of these patients. Okay. So apart from central node, which I think is really a big breakthrough for the lymphedema bit, uh, if unfortunately a woman has to have a complete axillary dissection or undergo radiation, are there any prevention tips you can give her for lymphedema to prevent it? So, so for lymphedema, you know, I have, I'm, I'm very convinced that the earlier you start physiotherapy right. uh, and uh, the lymphedema precaution, precautions should happen and they should continue for a lifetime. There is no, wow. uh, you know, um, uh, taking back on that. So you need to continue to do those exercises religiously uh, and even during radiation. Because in radiation, what happens is once you go down to the radiation suite and you think, oh, well, I'm under treatment, so I will not do my exercise. You must continue to do that because radiation added on to the surgery can actually compound uh, the problem further. And what is a 20, 25% risk of uh, lymphedema can go up to even right. 50%. So I think most women just stop exercising. Yes. They, they did it for six months. They did it for a year. That's more than enough. Now I don't need to do it anymore. And they kind of forget... As, as time goes by after surgery, you want to just forget the whole experience. So they just forget to, to exercise. I, I found that very often. Yes, very true. That is, uh, this non-compliance is something that ad, uh, affects them adversely. And you need to do small things like, you know, manual lymphatic drainage. Our physiotherapist, uh, you know, would teach them how to drain fluid because right. it's common knowledge. Anywhere, uh, if there is surgery, even radiation, you know, there will be inflammation, there will be fluid collection. So you need to gently drain these areas, which is very easy to do. And uh, you will actually escape lymphedema altogether. So uh, uh, most women, if not all, should, should consult an oncophysiotherapist according to you. That is important. And I think we need to create this cadre of uh, oncophysiotherapists because you will realize that not many hospitals not offer the very few. oncophysiotherapy. Absolutely right. Yeah, this so I, I was very sure that I needed one. And so that's how we, uh, we have this extremely, extremely, uh, you know, uh, what do you call professional and experienced physiotherapist. Just does wonders for even yeah. patients with lymphedema. So I'm sure in major cities of India, you will find one or two in the city and you need to go to the right people. Right. That's what I think Dr. Geeta is suggesting. Uh, I had a question, Geeta. Uh, 
what are the different types of reconstruction if you can just simply tell us because a lot of women come to me again after the chemo is over and say now i want a reconstruction and i'm looking at them completely blankly so uh, what what do i tell my patients and when is the right time to do the reconstruction so now what has happened is with the uh, you know the indications of radiation therapy having been increased to even one node positive you can almost be certain that most of your patients would require uh, uh, radiation also so if the patient doesn't require radiation so then immediate breast reconstruction is a good idea so and the best form of reconstruction would be using your own tissues to create a breast mound which is an autologous breast reconstruction so here what uh, what is done is your tummy fat you know so it's i always uh, this is the way i counsel my patients if they're interested in getting a reconstruction done i'd say you get a tummy tuck also for free ah. <laughs> you're going to get all that fat in your underbelly especially if you've not had a cesarean in the past it is very easy to uh, pick up uh, it's called the df flap is the way to go df means it's an art shape with that uh, skin and fat for abdomen uh, you could take it from the back also which is the uh, latissimus dorsi muscle but the latissimus dorsi muscle per se may not be sufficient to give you a decent mound in mm -hmm. that an implant based you know ld assisted implant based reconstruction is what is recommended but with implant the problem is uh, you know if you were to have an autologous reconstruction the timing does not matter you can have it immediate okay. you can have it delayed but if it is a implant the radiation oncologists are not very happy you know in the implant yes. because what happens is uh, there is a capsule that forms around the prosthesis and um, that can sometimes become very painful and hard and then you will have to go in for another surgery to have a capsulectomy and replace the protein quite a nuisance and then these recent uh, very finely textured implants have this very 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 small risk of tumors have so there is a lot that is uh, ganging up against use of implants but um, otherwise if you were to do it as a delayed procedure you can use implants and if you're very keen that you don't want to wake up without a breast then the next best thing to do is use an expander expander is a, again a form which is placed under the muscle and you can continue hmm. to expand it to the uh, exact size quiet. when you're going in for radiation you can deflate that and have I think we've lost her. Uh, can somebody do something, Vidyut? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, her uh, net connection was weak. We'll see. Are there any other questions that that we can take in the meantime, Rebecca? Do you have anything? Hi, Gita. Have we got you back? Yeah, yeah. I'm back. Uh, so there is uh, somebody uh, me here who's our pain specialist she's a supportive uh, supportive care and palliative and pain specialist uh, and she uh, you know i am just for your information also that for the, for everybody's information that some people have this chronic post mastectomy pain syndrome something that you know we are unable to deal with and uh, dr megha pruth is here megha i Please. Can you unmute Dr. Megha? Please. Okay, Megha. Yeah. Hello. Hi. So Megha is a pain and palliative specialist with us, and uh, very interested in uh, you know uh, getting our patients pain free because I keep discussing this with Megha and saying the pain is a very unpleasant symptom. So. Uh, if you could uh, tell us what would you do in a patient who's got chronic post mastic pain it's not very often but mm. yeah. 
Yeah, so I think uh, post mastectomy pain, mostly uh, the causes as uh, Dr. Geeta discussed, um, intercostal brachial neuralgia, kind of pain in the inner part of the arm is common. Otherwise, sometimes even the scar pain uh, remains. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So, is it cracking? Is it cracking? So, it's all yeah. right. It's all right. Yeah. So, um, I think post mastectomy. So, uh, pain prevention is easier than actually treating once the pain has become chronic. So, uh, I think uh, treating the pain if the patient has pain preoperatively. So, treating it preoperatively, then helping the patient immediate post-operative period. Uh, pain uh, must be treated at that point. So that kind of decreases the incidence of chronic post-mastectomy pain. But once the patient has developed it, then we have uh, kind of neuropathic, uh, some agents for uh, neuropathic pain, like you all must have heard about gabapentin and pregabalin and amitriptyline, those things. So uh, those agents help uh, patients. But again, we need to uh, start them early and continue it uh, for at least 8 to 12 weeks. And if the pain still does not go away, then we have some injections uh, for them. Like if there's scar neuralgia, we can inject uh, some uh, local anesthetic along with steroids in the scar. And that uh, helps the pain to go down. And then plus, of course, the medications. Then um, sometimes the pain in the shoulder or pain in the upper limb continues. So uh, at that point, I think uh, sometimes even steloid ganglion, uh, like sympathetic uh, chain block sympathectomies, uh, using steloid ganglion blocks or uh, we also do T2, T3 sympathectomies. So uh, some nerve blocks are also helpful in those conditions. Thank you, Megha, because, you know, pain is something that is a very specialized area and I think we pay very little attention to it. Unfortunately, we have Megha who takes care of all our chronic pains, <laughs> chronic and uh -huh. pain that we don't understand. <laughs> thanks, yeah. thanks, Oman. So, is, somebody has asked uh, Geeta, is it necessary to wear a sleeve? So not always, you know, uh, if you don't have lymphedema, you can, uh, you know, there are some studies to show that, you know, if you were to wear your sleeve or if you were to do bandaging while you're getting your radiation done, it helps to prevent lymphedema. Even, you know, it's as a prophylactic, prophylactic meaning as a preventive to lymphedema, you can, but it is not a necessary mandate. Then the uh, thing about uh, air travel, till some years ago, it, you know, these are things that, keep changing and evolving. So there is no right or wrong to it. Uh, but uh, we, I still advise patients to wear a compression sleeve while they do, they're uh, okay. you know, applying because uh, of the difference in the pressure in the air cabin. Ah. So you, that can give rise to um, lymphedema, can, can in, uh, initiate a lymphedema in patients who are traveling by air. So it's probably better to wear a compression sleeve then but at all other times, not really. But if you have lymphedema, then of course, you have to uh, do both bandaging and sleep during the days, bandaging at night. Okay. And uh, uh, what about lifting heavy objects, Kika? Because we keep telling our patients not to lift heavy objects. You did cover this to some extent with the operated side. Is that lifelong? Again, lifelong, but uh, not more than five kgs. I think it is about asymmetrical weights, you know, carrying a heavy suitcase or a bucket of water. These are kind of asymmetric weights. You know, you don't know which way you're going. But if you do the dumbbells, you know, or a, a kettlebell, you know, kettlebell. So you, that, that's fine because then you are, it's a, it's a graded kind of weight. That is fine because you're doing it gently. Yanking things, pushing uh, heavy uh, objects, all that is a no-no. That is what is not uh, recommended. So long as your muscles are doing a gentle, uh, you know, pumping action, it's all good. But the moment it happens to be a little, uh, you know, asymmetrical and too, uh, you know, isometrics, not, not purely isometric or isotonic exercises, that is when uh, your um, lymphatic channels get compromised. Okay. 
Now, somebody has asked a question about numbness in the feet, which is, is it normal after two years? So that is for you to answer <laughs> that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, that has been He's created out by, on this one, by <laughs> the taxal chemo that your medical oncologist has given you. And although it is reversible, in pa some patients who have diabetes, who have a B12 deficiency, and in just some patients, if you've had weekly paclitaxel for 12 weeks, it can persist in 30% in of cases uh, permanently. It does reduce a little bit in intensity, but you will always have to be careful with your feet. And, and that's, that's a little price that you will have to pay for that. You will have to change your footwear, change the way you walk, be careful of slippery surfaces. So there's certain kind of uh, a care, particular care you will have to take of your feet. Then I think some just, just as your patients, you know, just as our patients come to <laughs> saying, you know, arm numbness, your patients come back to us saying, feet, what do I do with my feet? <laughs> and then you point in the direction of, of the I medical said, oncologist. Have you been to see a medical <laughs> oncologist? <laughs> So yeah. well, we went there, so they gave us gabapentin and pregabalin and all that. So I was, I also not everybody know. can handle gabapentin. So then some of them get real dizziness. Okay, they say, what yes. the hell have you given me? So you've got to start in really low doses and titrate it as you go up. Okay. So uh, anything else? Any, any burning questions, Rebecca? You want to add anything? Is there anybody else who needs something answered urgently? Somebody, uh, Manisha, Manisha ji was raising her hand. Does she want to ask a question? What does Vandana say about something after 27 years? Vandana, would you like to unmute yourself? Can she unmute herself? No? And speak up? Manisha ji is unmuted. I will, I will unmute her. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I was saying that I have numbness even after 27 years. So you get used to being you like I'm a survivor of 27 years. My goodness, fantastic. So in yeah. your feet after 27 years? Yeah, even oh after. God. Oh my God. What chemotherapy did you get, Vandana? Did you get <laughs> it? There was no paclitaxel, no? Exactly. No, 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 no. no. Well, I had ABVD, but it has continued. So, so, ah, so if you had ABVD, then it is the wind blasting which could have caused this. Probably. But yeah. now I've got so used to it. So that's Absolutely. what I was trying to tell the others. Why, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Manisha ji, you wanted to ask something? Can't hear you. No. Hello? Yes. Ma'am, unmute yourself. We have unmuted already. Okay, there's another question here, uh, Gita, uh, from Jyoti. She said she had cancer in the left breast but had no surgery done. Now there's a recurrence. Is it okay to prick the left arm vein for chemo? So now in your revised lymphedema precautions, the pricks prick thing has also gone out. So you apparently can. With all the precautions, you can. Uh, and the other thing is you've had no surgery. So that's fine. If you've not had surgery, your nodes are intact, you're good to go. So you are recommending that you can prick these patients? With caution. Have... With caution. Of the, not of, the, of the list of things that you should not be doing, I'm, right. I would still, uh, you know, say yeah. that to be caution because if your vein is not of a good caliber, if there is any thrombophytitis, right. then we're done. Then we yeah. will be in big yeah. soup. So you've got to be really careful. Okay. Yes. So anything else? Gita, that was absolutely fabulous. I really enjoyed it. It's, it was very practical and I think you kind of went through the pre-op to the post-op and you covered almost every, every aspect. So thank you so much for being with us. 
Thank and uh, uh, thanks for all the good work you're doing. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And thank you to all those who took, their, took time out to attend this uh, webinar. And thank you for inviting me. It's Not been a pleasure. Not at all. Bye.